Today we are going to complete uh, what we were saying yesterday about introduction to the topic, introduction to human-computer interaction and in particular let's start with another definition that's a definition that we will find and we will use later on in the course that's a definition that is central to human-computer interaction it's not the only one, it's not the most comprehensive definition but it's one of the important definitions that is the definition of usability right we said yesterday that systems applications should be usable used and useful and so this cover for good part the usable thing and usability as defined here is actually an ISO standard definition so it's not a definition made up but it's an official definition according to a standard that could be also retrieved and used against to, val to verify if it's compliant with the standard. So the definition of usability will still give us, again, some concept that we already have seen yesterday. Uh, so the definition is usability is the extent to which a system product or service can be used by specified user so again people to achieve a specific goal again goals in a specific context of use so again the application domain we mentioned yesterday with effectiveness efficiency and satisfaction so it gives other three attributes usability it should be something that is effective useful is something that can resemble this can be should be efficient and should be satisfactory again the frustration we mentioned the first class is something that came back here as satisfaction okay here there is a chair here there's another chair that can be moved so don't stand use the chairs right no so it, as i said before is is smaller it shouldn't be so small it's smaller because of the it's for the lab here there's a chair you can bring it you can take it if you want if you don't want to stand one hour and a half and also there there's a chair that's a backpack can stay somewhere else okay do you want to say still there is a chair here huh? so you just oh okay well, well, as you want. <laughs> so we also um, participants. Uh, so again, these back disability. These three topics are get back here: people, goals, and context of use that we mentioned as application domain. And then these, as a good standard, as some notes that specify that users goal and context refer to the particular combination of user goal and context for which usability is being considered so not in general not any user in any context with any goal but in a specific context which we have users that want to fulfill specific set of user that want to fulfill specific goal in a specific domain these three things are linked together and the other notes that say is that the word usability is also used as a qualifier to refer to a lot of things design knowledge competencies activities and attributes that contribute to usability such as usability expertise usability engineering usability testing etc so as an adjective for pertaining something else but the definition from the standard is that one on the top with these notes in addition others in a non-standard way let's say can define his ability how how well people can use system functionality and this well is clearly 
um, can be measured under different perspective. Mm? It could be easy to use, it could be time to use, it could be efficiency, again, efficiency, effectiveness, etc. And the dimension of usability mm, that are complementary with the standard are typically these. So one thing is usable if it's useful, if it's easy to learn, if it's easy to remember how to use it once learned, if it's effective, so it's allowed to reach the goal that for which the system has been created, is efficient, so once learned, it is fast to use. If the system state is visible, if there are few errors using the system and those few errors are recoverable, and again, if it's satisfactory, so it's enjoyable up to a certain extent to use. So all of these are dimensions of usability that we should keep in mind when we are creating from scratch or redesigning or re-assessing uh, uh, application, system, product, service, whatever. Hmm? So useful, learnable, memorable, efficient, effectiveness, effective, visible, hmm? state of the system is visible, you know where you are and what you're doing in the system, errors, few, and recoverable, and enjoyable to use. And keep in mind some of these because we will meet again. And so the visibility will be actually one principle and one guideline we will meet as a way to apply to evaluate system. Hmm? Similarly, errors and also others. Hmm? So some of these dimensions, we will also find them in more structured way moving on. So overall, hmm, get again to the book I mentioned the first class, usability can be also simplified in the sense don't make the person using your system application, etc., think before doing something. So the idea is that you should look at a page, you should look at an application and know almost immediately what you can do, which are the options, how to recover from errors, how to proceed without wondering, oh, but is this done in this way or I'm bre breaking something if I do things in this way or another, etc. So it should be immediate, like in the picture, let's say here, Mm, this side and not oh where should you start why did they call it in that way can I click on that etc and uh, all of these as we have seen yesterday with the model of Norman are not things that we spend hours thinking mm, but that we typically think in milliseconds seconds so small amounts of time and then but it's create can create confusion can create opportunity for errors opportunity for things that don't work or system that that a certain point break because people go in a path that is not well was not the right one according to the creator of the system and the design process that we more or less follow but this is taken from a book of human computer interaction so it's not something that we invented today is, is more or less this. This is a simplified design process. We have mentioned some design processes yesterday. This is like a more general uh, and simplified um, process that start from what is wanted or better, what is needed. That is the need finding phase. Then move to an analysis phase that say, okay, we understood the need, we understood the problems, we understood the issue, we understood the context. Let's try to analyze it, let's try to summarize it and put it in a little bit more concrete and actionable way. Hmm? This brings to the design of something, hmm? the creation of something. Okay, this is a user interface with this layout, these colors, this number of pages, this architecture of the information, these elements. It will need to follow some guidelines, some principle, etc. And then here start one loop that say, okay, we need to prototype the design in some way. We need to evaluate in some way the design and maybe we go back to the analysis. We need to change something and then again to the design. And we will do this loop 
between design and prototype um, two times and a half mm -hmm. so we will do a design and a prototype of a low fidelity application then we will evaluate it with this heuristic evaluation that is an evaluation by expert where you are going to be the expert by, by then and then after the low fidelity prototype we will you will uh, design and prototype a part of a medium fidelity prototype and then design and evaluate this time with users with people with your target population the high fidelity prototype the one that will be in code mm -hmm. so this is map with the uh, assignment that we mentioned the first class basically mm -hmm. and you will find the same name low fidelity medium fidelity and high fidelity and we will cover what it means and, and how to build a low medium and high fidelity prototype with pros and cons for each but we will iterate here clearly we also implement something mm, but only in the prototype phase so we are not going to implement the final product the final application neither deploy it to a large population we will stop with prototypes with a high fidelity good quality prototype and we will stop there mm. so we will not follow this process all until the implementation and deploy uh, and commercialization clearly uh, and we and while you can loop multiple time between design and prototype and analysis etc we'll just loop two times and let's say and a half in this hmm? because it's a semester long course it's not a five years long course so clearly it should be um, adapted hmm, to the context but the various uh, elements you will learn as clearly applicable hmm, over multiple other contexts over longer time mm -hmm. and also we will do the evaluation with a small number of people even if it would be better to have a larger number of people but again this is because it's a course and it's to get started to learn how to do things mm -hmm. so which are the three phases the first one is need finding we are going to speak about it in a moment so I will just postpone it to after the second phase is but we said that already it's about extracting needs from people the second phase is analysis so formalize and structure these needs in something more concrete in something unique not a set of 11 needs from multiple people we need to structure in something that can be used as a requirements to moving on then the design the design of the system first in terms of user interface then also, also at a certain point in terms of the system architecture uh, that will consider different type of users guideline principle visual layout if it's a um, visual user interface etc and then design is made by supported by intermediate verification that also allow to evaluate the design at a certain moment through prototype and evaluation involving people in some way or another and then also the implementation deployment that we said we will do a little bit of implementation for the prototype but not for the final products that will also include uh, hardware and software implementation documentation public release release notes etc but these are outside let's say of the scope here and so just to conclude if you just did some software engineering course or you're doing some software engineering course well in software engineering there are many processes uh, these are four of them uh, and so very quickly then if you want you can look at the slides but it's not incredibly fundamental here and today if we ask ourselves where how does HCI fit in all this process and the answer is generally always a step ahead a step ahead of the requirements you need to understand which are these requirements so understanding the needs before um, releasing something releasing uh, something in a cycle you need probably to evaluate usability you need to experiment with user you need to experiment different flows etc mm. this is not because HCI is better than software engineering it's not a competition clearly but because 
not including people in something that is made for people uh, will produce problems later on hmm? and this is demonstrated that involving people solve many of the problem that one needs then to fix after the application the system is deployed in the wild with maybe hundreds or thousands of people using it so it's better to solve the problem at the beginning when maybe you are not still feature complete and you maybe solve that with 10 people then discover a major usability problem when it's sold for to a lot of people and then customer in that case will not be happy with you mm, that they have to pay the product and then you have to redesign significantly mm. and this is actually uh, you can find not only scientific papers but also industrial reports that say that okay and here there are a few example and references that are if you want you can have a look but again i would prefer to move on with actually what will take all today and all the lecture of next week and will be the topic of the first lab hmm? that is need finding so why not uh, so how many of you know what is a google home okay so the google home right the device the circular device the, that one here I don't know how much is visible in the end, but how do you think it is? All of fame or of shame, given the limitation of the technology? The Google Home, per se. All of fame is not that bad, right? I mean, you have to... Um, with, it's, it's the same as the others. It doesn't do anything really bad with respect to the others, and it's more or less like the other similar device that have. And clearly, it's limitation due to the peculiarity of voice-based interaction that are common to all these devices. It's not just Google Home. So I don't know if you ever have seen this video. This is called Italian Grandmother Learning to Use Google Home Abroad. So let's have a look at this and then ask ourselves, is still more in the Hall of Fame or still in the Hall of Shame? For, let's say, this kind of this part of people cuckoo <laughs> what is really today what <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my god <laughs> it's a yeah you say yeah yeah it's her oh my god is it a woman yeah i'm glad to meet what you what is this thing <laughs> <laughs> hello cuckoo hey you're okay I get it! You're stupid. <laughs> 
because I don't understand everything I'm saying to you. Hello, Google. Okay. 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 Do it. <laughs> okay, so um, now consider Google Home for as a device for elderly people, right? No, not for so Google Home is TV is a device for general purpose for everybody. It's sold in that way. It's sold in that way. Now let's consider just people uh, after a certain age that has limited um, experience with technology, surely not with a thing that you speak with and it reply according to your request. So what you have seen in the way the lady interact with Google Home, do you think a Google Home provide a good experience, a good way of interaction with this person or not? Why not? Yeah, because you said not, then we... Difficulty in pronunciation of Google, that for, for us is pretty easy to, to say. That's one. It's not intuitive. Well, this is a problem, all the voice-based user interface. You don't know how to use it because it has no... It said, so the correct word is, the, we will meet this again, uh, it, it has no affordances. Mm, the term is affordances, visual interface, physical words as affordances that tell us how to use them. Sometimes wrongly, but they have. A voice user interface doesn't have affordances. We just have a box put there with a speaker and nothing else to do. That's a problem with all voice-based interface, unfortunately. Uh, the lady was doing a thing that It was, yes, it was tapping on the, like you tap on the shoulder of a person, like, listen to me. Hmm? You tap on the shoulder of the person. So this is, let's say, intuitive for, for the person. Like, I want to talk with, to get the attention of someone that is not maybe seeing me, and I'm tap on the shoulder, for instance. So that is, you know, an opportunity to redesign no? Google Home to just have also this, for instance, option to wake up with a tap. So this is 2017, so maybe they, now they have, I don't know. But still, hmm, if we think of a product or something in a general context, for you, you will probably never thought of tap on it. If they tell you, you have to say, okay, Google, or hey, Google, you will say, okay, Google, and then ask something. Instead, this person, even saying you have to say okay Google or a Google, most of the time we say okay, a, or okay a Google, but not the the expected wake up word. Hmm? And clearly the device didn't reply correctly. And also notice another thing I don't know when the person asked for sing for a song, what she did. Yes, yeah, so it's with the language because the song was in Italian, but she started singing. She singing the song. Like, I want this song, please sing with me. Right? If I ask you to sing a song, I would need to give you maybe the title, but if you don't know the, the song, I, I, I will not. But hypothetically, a person can start singing the song to you to just say, okay, maybe you don't know the title, but you know the song because it's famous. So it has in a way, anthropologize um, Google Home to, to get this information out, to get a reaction out. Mm? And clearly that is not designed in that way. Mm? So all of these are opportunity for, let's say, designing a better voice device, voice-based device, that again, this, this is here in the need find finding phase, because you will probably never experience something like this because it's easier for you to say Google. It's maybe you never thought of tapping on it because it work or singing something to, to a device. But if you change the context, if you change the population, the same device is not going to work anymore. So this is here need finding just as another example how 
something that is a product is available for many will have, can have problem can have issues when you change population and you change context of use like in this case just keep this in mind we are not seeing that again uh, so the goal of need finding is actually to understand which are the system requirements and the user need need finding finding needs and then we also we see tools and instruments to do that and we want requirements, we want user need to avoid the problem that Google Home has with the elderly if we want to do something for the elderly. So, well, we are just in this phase, clearly, the first one of the process. So let's start with what are needs. We made an example already, uh, but let's try to describe them a little bit better because I can assure you that this first step of the course will be the most difficult for you. The other will be easy, in a way, but this one will require a change, and trust me in that for now, will require a change of perspective for you. Hmm? Because what you are most used to, many of you at least, is to start from some requirement. You have to build on a web application that does A, B, C, D or you need to build a mobile application that has these features or fulfill this goal. Here, you won't have any of that. Here, you will be the one that at the end will, let's say, write that specification. And nobody is going to tell you what the application is doing. And people that you will speak with will give you hints to write those specification. So this step is something that you have little experience or no experience in, and it's actually often difficult for many the others the prototyping is easier in a way because you already have specification you already know which is the end goal of the application of system so what are needs needs there are two definitions i can give you to needs one is needs are human emotional or physical necessities that is similar to one of the definition of need that some of you gave in the first lecture necessities physical physiological emotional etc cognitive necessities another definition is that needs are also gap in a system and let me switch slide for a moment this picture gives the idea of a gap in a system so where is the gap in this system here depicted Well, we, yes, we don't know if the path is too long for sure, but we know that people, people to, to pass here, right? To pass on the grass. Mm. So this is a gap in a system, mm. the system path around the campus, let's say. Uh, maybe it's too long, maybe I don't know, but surely this is probably quicker, etc. So this is a, a possible, in a way, representation of a gap something that people do because you see that people do a lot and it was not thought before because the street the pathway is on another side so these are an example clear simple example of gaps in a system other gaps in a system is when you have maybe a system something that people are doing and it's complicated or they are doing and redoing and redoing or they found workaround to do those kind of things so these are two definitions of uh, needs. Necessities and gaps in a system. And to help you write, identify needs, you also have to consider that they are verb, not noun. Hmm? Nouns are solutions. Nouns are products. Nouns are services. Needs are verb. So if you think at the example we made in the first class, where well, we said that people wanted a faster horse, a faster horse is a name, is a thing, hmm? it's a noun, it's a solution. And we said that time that the hypothetical need in that case is moving, going faster from one place to another. So going faster, going is a verb, 
And you cannot make a verb with a faster horse. Make a faster horse, but still that's supportive of faster horse as a design. It say what you want. It doesn't say what you want to accomplish, that instead is going faster from one place to another. Hmm? So needs are when you need to find those and write those, keep in mind that if you're writing a, na a noun, that's not a need. If you're writing a verb, that is a good probability that is a need. And needs are activities and desired with which people can use help to do them. Hmm? And often it's helpful to use the phrase, someone needs a way to do something or someone needs to be able to do something to describe needs. Hmm? So this is a trick to write better needs and to identify needs in an easier way when you will need to. Hmm? And needs emerge directly either from user traits, from what you can see, observe, know, or from contradiction between traits. Like there are two things that they are contradicting a little bit, and so in the middle there is a spot, there is an opportunity to do things. Hmm? Um, and also they can emerge, as an example, as disconnect between what they say, the typically is the want, and what they do. Hmm? Maybe uh, I'm showing you how I book the, I enroll in an exam and I'm telling you something. And maybe what I told you is different from what I'm showing you. <coughs> so the disconnect between the show and the tell could be a space in where a need can emerge. So what is need finding? Need finding is clearly discovering opportunities by recognizing these gaps. Mm? And clearly in the, in, the, in the sense of the grass is just do a path there. Mm? And through need finding, we need to figure out a story. So need finding is mostly about figuring out the story of people doing something in a specific context. Some people doing something in a specific con context. And we need to understand the what and the why of the story to generate a new story that is the application, the service, whatever will be realized at the end. Hmm? And you can just see from here, from what I told you, for instance, a disconnect between what they say and what they do, that there are two big families of methods to do need finding. One that involve what they say and what they do. What that involve interviewing. interviewing, speaking with people. And the other one, do? Observing. Observing. Observing activities. Recreating, having them recreate activities. These are two big families of all, all the methods, let's say need finding, are under these two families. Something is about speaking with people, something is about looking at what people are doing. Some people, specified people, in a specific context to do a specific activities. These three ingredients that I mentioned too many times now are always to be keep in mind, especially in this phase. You have some people doing something in a specific context, and the context is fundamental. Think about, again, Google Home. In that home, or in a home without elderly people. Hmm? The context change, the people change. So the main, let's say, questions behind it finding is what the user need. That's easy, it's in the name. But to understand what the user need, we need to answer these other three, let's say, question. Again, who are the users? how they are doing it now, the goal they want to accomplish, and what is the context in which they are doing it now. Again, who are the people, what is the goal, and what is the context? And then the last one is, can we just ask them? But clearly no, because if we just ask them, what do you need? we will came up with answer like a faster horse. So wants, not needs. Hmm? So these are the three 
things again to keep in mind. So about people, it's less simple than it appears. So who are the users you are want to focusing on? And this is a decision you will make you will have to make. It's a uniform set of people or you want to speak to specific categories groups. Are they young? Are they old? Which is their age? Which is their experience within the context? Are they novice, so they are learning, or they're experienced? So immediately, the first thought is to think about generic user, but here you should really focus on some specific subset of them. So let's make an example. Let's say that the context is learning languages, foreign languages. And um, foreign languages. OK, so who, who can be the people that can be involved in learning foreign languages? Let's say you want to innovate in the field of learning foreign languages. Which are the people? Which are the different categories, kind of people you can think of? Some of them. People who like to travel, it could be one category, versus people that... People that need it for work or for uh, maybe university. So people, okay, so people who like to use the language for leisure activities like travel and people that need to use it for work. This is one, two categories that can be also split in others. Other categories. Children, adult, elderly, children who travel with the parents, children, uh, adults that need them for work, or, or adults that need to, um, to travel for leisure. Other categories. In which setting we are learning language? In a classroom or on its own? That's another category. So all children in class with a teacher learning a language for something. Or children at home with their parents learning a language for others, etc. Right? So these are all possible combinations. You will need to pick some of them. Uh, the experience. Do we want to consider the, the previous experience with learning a language. So are we speaking, thinking of people that don't know the language or people that already have some knowledge or people that don't know any other foreign language except the native one or not? Or are we thinking of people, let's say Italian people learning English to travel but living in Italy in that moment or we're thinking of Persian people moving to Italy to study and needing to learn Italian to live here, but they live here, so they live in the context of the language, versus people moving towards another, learning the language in a context different where the, con the language is used. All this make just the who are the users. And if you are doing something technologically, think of Google Home and the lady, how experienced they are with technology. A lot of experience, no experience at all, and that will change your decision moving on. So one thing you will have to figure out is who are the people that you want to consider in this way, thinking in the various category. And paying attention that the category is large, is too much large or not too small because that will limit your possibility and during the lab we are there to help you clearly to avoid you making things like I want to see this for uh, all the elderly that's wide category or for children between three and four years old that is probably as too little category right just using age an example most of the time, 
keep in mind that you are not a representative user so anything that starts with I will do this way is something to forget in this page so designer, developer, your skill, your knowledge, your attitude, your background, your interest, etc. are totally unlike those of your users of the user of the system, the application you're going to create there are exceptions if you are designing something for university student, you may have some int for that but clearly you shouldn't focus still on what you think because the goal is getting the other perspective also, not yours only and if you're in a company, also the client or the boss or the manager or the director are not the representative user, they often believe that to know oh but we need this hmm? but often they don't um, and also in that case it's always better to get if possible the actual hmm, final use user of the system or the application you're thinking of so the two categories talk with people and uh, observe what they are doing um, how you talk with people we will see some of them but the two main let's say point to talk with people are surveys and interviews so you do you know which is the difference between surveys and interviews high level difference what's a survey a set of question that's also an interview, a set of questions, right? So yes, but maybe interview is, uh, one interview can be different from uh, another, mm -hmm. depending on the person you are interviewing, and the survey is the same for all the people who you... We will see that it depends on the kind of interview, um, but there is a more, let's say, significant difference interview are done typically one to one. one to one not really also one to many but by voice right survey are instead typically done written it could be it's a form it could be digitally written or it could be on paper but still written mm? so they are different medium and yes with the interview you can also do some slightly in some cases if you want you can also do some extra question that you clearly in the form you cannot because the, in the survey you cannot because it's written so you cannot change the questions right in the moment you have to design the question in a way that works so this is the two big way with uh, variation with flavors especially for the interviews with taking with users and then there is another one that we mentioned yesterday it was a participatory de design that is including people in the design of some kind of system and we said it's a little bit uh, too, too complex and uh, watching users watching user is a but, bad term but let's say observing user uh, observing user if the observation session could be done live could be video recording could be asking them to keep a diary like a diary written like every time that you do this keep note of these things hmm? every time you enter at work keep track of the time you enter your feelings and the first activity you did you're doing drinking coffee checking emails whatever hmm? over a long period of time but it's keeping a diary like a, a dear diary that like that um, and this is clearly um, a way to also analyze the work and discuss um, and let's also give the opportunity the observation to have for instance an interview after to discuss the implication mm -hmm. but these are the two main families of thing and sometimes um, we don't have or we want to synthesize a user um, just to mention this, we are not going to, to do this in the course, we are trying to find non-imaginary people um, and 
we are going to um but there could be you know you are doing something that for for people i don't know um from astronauts or for the first electric car but you don't have yet an electric car so you're imagining a context that's not existent it happens rarely but it may happen so when a real user are not available or not available because you cannot afford them like you bring them in, in but you have to give them something if you're a company not for free not for volunteering and so you can in a very very difficult way but if you are very very expert on some specific domain you can imagine how a real user would behave and you can build imaginary users that both starting from imaginary users and also starting from the results of the finding process are called personas hmm, that are detailed description of an hypothetical person in a given role imagining that real people hmm. so this could be fake up at all or after speaking with 20 people synthetize the 20 different perspective or some of the maybe five different perspective in one imaginary person that sum up many common trait of these five people out of 20 you identified with a name with a role with something this is called personas is also is mostly useful for communicating hmm, needs to others instead of giving the details of the let's say 20 interviews and we said that people are important, we said the context is important, and we said the goals are important. One thing that we didn't say today is that we should also consider our assumption when we do need finding. So in a way, one thing that in finding doesn't do, but you have to keep in mind that before doing interviews and uh, before analyzing results, etc is frame the problem so many of you or all of you are engineering and engineering are typically known to be good to problem solving and this is that is problem framing so it's the step before and so we need to check our and other people's assumption on things to fully understand the need the context of it before proceeding otherwise we are again inserting our own perspective in the context in what we are going to discover so let's do this example uh, so let's imagine that you do a observation an interview and we will discover how to do this thing but at a certain point you will be show this this picture here what's the result what's the which is the solution of this problem eight. how many say eight hands up okay so not 80 percent the other 20 percent so clearly there is a trick here right otherwise okay so but let's say that you all say eight and it is you know you see this and the first thing that you think is eight right because four plus four okay now let's check how many assumptions you made because i never told you that this is math and never told you that this is a four actually and i never told you that this is base 10 for instance so you made a lot of assumption here you made assumption that this is a mathematical operation so it's four plus four so that sign is addition and the equal is the result of operation you made assumption that, that these are two four you made the assumption that this is base 10 i can tell you no this is by f base five so it cannot be eight because you don't have eight in base five i can tell you that these are not four these are flags flags like in a golf um in, in golf in sport that's why it's it is done by hand and not by computer because otherwise it would look more like four and i can tell you that plus maybe is not it's not addition it's concatenation 
So the result is 44, or two flags, one after the other. Now, this is, again, a simple example that will show you that if a person show you this, you immediately think, oh, this is eight, because you put in place assumption on what you know. And in need finding, all these assumptions are to be cleared out. You shouldn't have any of these assumptions, because this is your knowledge, your experience, your context, your culture that plays in, your education that plays in. So when you see this, what you should ask is probably, what are these? What is this? You should try to understand why the person is showing you exactly these symbols. For you, these should be symbols with symbols, some symbols. Hmm? If you are given just these and no context at all, these are your assumptions in place. Clearly, if you are speaking with a math teacher and the question is, can you show me an operation that you do with your children in school? This, the one you say, eight, and all the assumptions you put are the right one. But that is the context in place. If like here, you have no context, and I told you no context, I say, let's imagine a person during an interview show you this. I didn't say it's in a class. It's math. I didn't say any context. So if you don't have any context, don't make assumption. As you did, as I did the first time I've seen this, actually, as probably everybody de do the first time, almost everybody do the first time that they see this. Okay? So keep in mind that this could not be eight, but it could be two flags, one after the other. Or that is four plus four minus minus, so it would be seven dot eight. Who knows, right? Don't make assumptions. Hmm? So I, I hope that this will remain in mind to you for the assumption part. Okay, any question about this before moving on to methods? Hmm? So. Before applying a need finding method, you have to first understand who are your people that you are going to speak with. Second, define which is the context in which you are putting the effort. Third, before, during, and after the need finding, keep in mind that your assumption may be wrong. So don't assume anything. Just if you, even if you're sure that something in that way, just ask or just get the assumption out of the people. Yeah. And similarly, if you're saying something, maybe a person is so used to show, to do something that will go fast and will put some assumption in place, or we tell you something with some assumption in place, just check the assumption before saying, okay, it's done. <coughs> so assumption are a cause of trouble in many, many, places in many, many contexts. Mm -hmm. What we start with assumption, especially when we work with people that are in some way different from us, in other culture, in other language, etc. And four, pick the right uh, need finding method. Mm -hmm. So in this course, we are going to tell you exactly which need finding method to use. So you, you just have to prepare for using that. So, which are the, defined, the need finding methods? These are, let's say, the six most um, uh, important methods. We are not going to see all of them. Like diaries, I already told you what is a diary. We are not going to see the diary. Um, but we are going to see many of them. So, observation. We already said, what is observation to you? Give me a operational definition of observation. Observation. What you imagine is observation. Uh, uh? Looking at something and uh, maybe write down what you notice 
looking at something and write down what you notice or looking at someone better right good diaries we said interviews yeah we said that but said let's say this again interviews are question one to one in this case one to one focus group You've heard probably focus group somewhere, but it's a need finding methods. It's close to interviews. One to many. It's a group interview. Uh, survey forms in written format. And last one, contextual inquiry. That's, a, that's more, that's harder than the others. So observation diaries are in the family of looking at people interviews focus group and surveys are in the family of talking with people contextual inquiry is not in one of this family is in both is an inquiry so an interview that is bind on the context so includes an observation is a mix between an observation and an interview because observation has some big advantages and some disadvantages interviews are more or less the opposite advantages and disadvantages and contextual inquiry try to balance this uh, thing mm -hmm. okay observation so observation can be split in uh, um, let's say Observation is typically intended as ethnographic observation, like the one that a researcher going up remote part of the world, maybe that never reach, never technology never reached that part, and live with people and observe the behavior, the context, etc., to, to to derive information, to derive the way of living of these people. So the observation is in general embedding yourself in the user's environment, culture, and behavior. It's like being one of the people you, you observe. And the goal of observation is, in general, to obtain the data, the information, to influence the interfi interface, the application design or redesign, if it already exists. Observation allows you, more than others, to learn the language of that people use in that context and their environment so if you're going to observe nurses they will use specific language if you're going to serve students they will use a different language than nurses and and if an application is for one category or the other you will need to learn the language to use the same language in the interface in the application observation depends which kind of observation you're going to do uh, but it's about most listening and observing carefully not just watching like watching a, a movie or a tv series is actually observing the person or the people doing the work in their context typical observation are audio video recorded and most of the time all the time there is someone that takes note so there is observation plus not taking because you need information to proceed and there are three risks in general in observation one is misinterpreting observation your assumption play a role another one is disrupting the normal operation because you are going to observe let's say nurses in an hospital but nurses in hospital typically work without you so you are in that environment in the moment. So you are disrupting the normal operation. And especially doing to the uh, assumption or something that happens due to the previous two points, you can uh, overlook important information. I'm s observing what's happening outside. Uh, okay no not okay or <laughs> okay uh, i have a question for you even though we are just looking at them we also need to listen to what they're saying 
so well it depends if you observe let's it depends on the kind of observation clearly but even observe let's imagine let's use the nurses uh, example you go hypothetically in an hospital and you observe a shift of a nurse well you clearly listen right to, to what they the people say to each other not to you but you observe and listen to the environment what they are saying what they're speaking how they relation with the patients a patient they speak how they do their work with all the senses i would say yeah the difference between observation is interviews that we will arrive at that point but the interview so if i interview you about how you prepared your last exam you have to remember what you did and tell me if your last exam is September maybe it's not a long time ago but if your last exam is six months ago maybe you don't remember exactly what you did day by day but if I observe you while you're preparing the exam I have fresh information and I see what happens not just the information that you want to tell me because you remember or you think are important that's the interview but also the things that you maybe think are not important but maybe to me observing becomes fundamental so what you should learn by observation what do people do so again you're observing nurses during a shift a three hour shift i don't know if it's three hour but let's say three hour shift so you're observing what they do in every moment of this travel shift rest speaking with colleagues speaking with patients speaking with doctors etc you see what values and goal do they have how they treat people for instance how the specific activity are embedded here say in a larger ecology that means how the specific activity or nurses are inserted in the larger hospital system so how they interact they maybe need to speak with a doctor with a pharmacist uh, with the parents of a patients they will receive they will be called by other one so it's in a more complicated system they just do their work uh, similarity and differences across people how they maybe you're serving multiple nurses and they will behave slightly different from one another and other type of context like time of the day so is the morning shift the same as the night shift in in all the sense as the things they are doing are the behavior they have etc or there are differences maybe there are activities that are common and other things that don't happen maybe in the night shift you don't have visits of other people of external people but in the morning shift you have and so you have to accommodate your activity with this thing and especially the touch it the touch it unspoken knowledge so what they do what you can observe them doing filling out a form throwing out a piece of paper yelling against against someone not finding something all the things that will not be explicitly said in an activity hmm? you also learn observing the process versus the practice so the process is how things are officially supposed to happen and the practice is how they are done in practice and in some cases they are the same in most of the cases they are not <coughs> because there are workaround tricks like oh i know that the process is this but i can make it faster or i will delay it because i need my ends free and so I will fill out a piece of paper in five minutes instead of now. Information learned from experience, etc. They're a part of the daily activity of the people. So if you think about yourself, uh, one thing is the process. For instance, <clears throat> let's say choosing a class between the three credits. You open your schedule of the courses for the next year you select a course you press from the list that you see on screen in the application on the website you select okay and you have done to selecting a single course 
But then there is the practice, like the course is not appearing. I need to search for it. I need to know it. And to know it, maybe as speaking with teachers, with other students, with other colleagues, with former students, etc. I need to open a ticket because something is not, is not working. So all of these is not part of the normal process, but still are the practice how each of you does the uh, schedule the work, the course load for the semester, for the year. And then maybe you enroll in a course and then you change your mind, you need to reopen the coursework and edit it, etc. Or the course is cancelled and so you will be assigned to another course, etc. Hmm? So these are practices, these are things that happen that are not predictable in the process. And all of these are things that you learn with observation. You cannot learn by interviewing people because you are missing the context in interviewing people. So which are the type of observation you can do? There are controlled observation, typically within a lab environment. That means you get people in another place that is not the normal working place and you ask them to redo or do the activity they typically do. This has advantages and disadvantages. Clearly, it is easy to reproduce. You have one room with a set of tools, and you come in people to do their activities with the set of tools. So it's easy to reproduce identically for everybody. It's also easy to analyze data because you set up everything, so you know what to expect. It's quick to conduct except for the recruitment, but once you have 20 people, 10 people in a list, you can say, okay, you come today, you come in an hour, you come in three hours, you come tomorrow, but you schedule them, and the activity is lasting half an hour, and you know, at a bunch of an hour, what you can go. And there is this, however, there is this author on effect that say that the act of observation of how someone does something can change their approach to carrying out the task. So observing you do something can change how you do something. And this is especially true if the environment is different from the usual environment, hmm? for which maybe they have tools that are similar but not identical to what they are using normally. Hmm? So these are advan advantages and disadvantages. The other type of observation is a na naturalistic observation that say, okay, as I said to you before, you want to go to the nurses in the hospital and see what they do. This has advantages, like it's more reliable because you see people in their own natural environment. It's more useful for ideation because you see the interaction with other people, etc., etc. You see the context at full. It's, however, difficult to make it replicable because if you go in one hospital, then another one could be slightly different in processes, etc. So maybe you don't have a full set of information. It's hard to manipulate external variable. If you want to observe how people work on a smartphone outside, if it's raining, they will have a behavior different than in a sunny day. And it's not something you can control in a naturalistic environment. Um, it's difficult to make them replicable, clearly, and in some cases it's not possible at all. If you ask a nurse to go to an hospital, the answer could be, no, you're not allowed. If you want to see how a surgeon is, is doing a surgical operation, it's not that, yes, please, can bring other 10 people with you. Because it's a controlled environment in that case, it has rules, it has processes, there is law, behind so it's not always possible to do naturalistic and one should uh, instead do the controlled one so according to the context again according to the people according to all the factors we have already said one could be better than the other or more doable than the other clearly the naturalistic is more expressive give you more ideas give you more opportunities to find needs than the other one but it's not always possible or applicable. And then there are two ways, and then we, are, we can stop here after, 
two ways of doing the observation in both cases in the controlled or in the natural environment one is what's called the complete observer and the other one is called the complete participant so the complete observer is like being part of the wall there are people doing their activities you're just there listening and watching in a corner of the room say nothing adding in almost anything to the environment just like the wall and the other one or the opposite is being the complete participant like you want to observe nurses then for that day you are a nurse you go the training with them you do the work with them clearly the thing you can do right but you leave one of them so if they make a break at a coffee machine you go with them at the coffee machine and chat with them you are one of the team that of people that you're serving and you can observe all the practices from a more intimate results and each of them has advantages and disadvantages so being like the wall you observe you interfere less but you probably need time to discuss with something you notice in the meantime and becoming a participant is not always possible is sometimes challenging because you need to be a nurse like the others be a student studying for an exam like the others and you also interfere because you're speaking with these people so you're not pulling or serving you are interacting with them and so you after you need to validate your observation in a more carefully way and analyze your data in a more carefully way asking yourself which assumption what they brought in the changed environment the change observation hmm? but these are the two extreme of the all observation one is just observing one is observing while being one of them hmm? again each one which advantages and disadvantages sometimes one is not possible and the other one the complete participant has more again get more information because you live the same life the same experience as the other the other one is stay on a distance not to interfere hmm? so it does again advantages and disadvantages um, well just just the last slide before moving so let me do that and what you can collect from the observation you can collect subjective and objective measure subjective measure we said are w uh, impression you can have question after you can maybe get some piece of paper you can write a summary report you can get some artifacts something that they do take some pictures etc and then you have also objective me measure like the workaround they put in place the error they do how many they are the incident they happens with the system with the environment etc the anecdote that you listen from them these are all data that can help you to then extract needs from all this observed data and continue with the analysis and synthesis of the work okay so we we stop here next time we'll start again from interview have a nice rest of the day